we've been looking at uh, at collisions. We found uh, a couple things. One is that if we look at the collisions between any two things, whether they're moving towards each other or not, doesn't matter. Um, we we came to understand that if we look at each one of them individually, and we're talking here about the type of collision where they hit and for some reason they stick together and go with just a single speed. That's the only type of collision we're talking about now. We'll expand on that in a little bit. Um, we, we came to understand that if we look at, at the individual object, whatever it is, then we have to take into account that individually each of them experiences an external force, external to themselves. Of course, they've hit something and that something's going to exert a force on them. But we, we didn't know anything about that force. We uh, also saw, if you remember, we need to know how long that force was acting. Remember there was a DT in there? What was that? Is that, it was over here? My Peter. Was that it? It was a terrible noise. I'm gonna go I'll go back and watch the tape. I'm gonna find out what that was. Find out who did it. Uh, we 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 couldn't know what the force was that was in there, we couldn't know how the time for how long it acted was in there, but then if we put the two together as a system, by uh, well we just put an imaginary boundary around them and said that's our system then that made any of the forces of collision internal forces it was an action reaction pair the one on the other anyway so those were equal and opposite they canceled internally and we didn't need to worry about that and we came up with this business that momentum would then be conserved by that, I mean the momentum of the system. Before collision, there's a certain momentum characteristic to the motion of the objects in the system. After collision, there's also a momentum characteristic to the two objects in the system, and that momentum between the two is exactly the same. And so uh, that allowed us to calculate that, that final velocity v prime we could without knowing anything about the forces that caused the changes in speed there and, uh, we, we were able to skip all that stuff however that doesn't mean there aren't collisions it's useful to pay attention to what that force is and so we're going to do that now um, anytime we have an external force acting on something and that force is unbalanced which means this sum doesn't go to zero then we expect there to be some acceleration so hopefully that's not news that should look pretty friendly and familiar to you <coughs> let me uh, uh, back up a little bit and just put in the definition for ourselves of velocity I mean, to, of acceleration. And uh, now I'm just going to do a little simple algebra. I'm going to multiply through by that dt. Simple uh, differential algebra, I guess you'd call it. And uh, uh, I don't know, that that's kind of an incomplete form there uh, because we don't really deal in lengths of time that are dt. Remember, those are time periods that are infinitesimally small. But let's go ahead and integrate over that time. Uh, we'll just go from 0 to some time t. And we'll integrate over, well, this has got to integrate over v, so it'll be v1 to v2. And let's make the other simple step that's very useful to us. We'll assume that the forces are constant and that the mass is constant, so we can go ahead and finish these integrals. So forces are constant. They come out. 
that leaves me with the integral of dt, which is dt. But I'll, I'll, again, I'll go ahead and just leave it as delta t, just in case. In fact, I guess that could be a little more complete. We could we could say t1 to t2, just to give us the option that t1 might not be zero. It doesn't necessarily need to be. And then this integrates to m delta v. Uh, that m delta v, we're familiar with that because that's what we've been working with for two or three days. That's the change in momentum. So no great shakes there, really, except we just took something we had anyway and went a step farther with it. We did have this f delta t before. Remember, that was when we first started with the collisions, but we had to come up with a way to ignore that because we didn't know what the forces were and we didn't know what the delta t's were. So we kind of said, let's, let's see if we can get, get around that somehow. And we got around it by putting the two objects together as a system. Now I'm coming back to it because what kind of physicist would we be if we ignored forces when they're there? All right, so let's take a look again in a very personal way at the two sides of this equation. One side there and one side there. Look at those in a very personal way and see if that doesn't help us understand what's going on with these forces and this time here. So I'm going to start with this first. m delta v, or if we were a little more complete, m2 minus, uh, m times v2 minus, minus v1. So let's make this real personal. Let's say that m is u. Some of you make a pretty good mass. Some of you a little more blobular than others, especially in your approach to life. Some of you are not so blobular. Bill, what are you? You a blob? Do you strive to be one? No. All right, so let's say this is, your, uh, uh, what's, a, what's an appropriate mass of a human being in kilograms, give or take? 90, pretty blobular that is. That's a little big, we'll say 70. We'll say 70. So we'll let m equals 70 kilograms. Oh, 90. You were thinking of, yeah, me. Yeah, sure. There. Solid steel. Uh, so we'll say that. Then let's, uh, let's pick some speeds that people typically go. Let's say this is you and you're in your car. How fast are you going in your car? Well, most of you go like, uh, let's see, on the streets of Queensbury in the 60s, out on the freeway in the 90s. Thank you for confessing. So we'll say uh, some reasonable speed like, uh, uh, well, I think the freeway speed out here is 65. So we'll say that, 65 miles per hour. Real quick. Make that into meters per second, please. Anybody have a, a unit conversion cell phone app? They have those? They must have them. Somebody, some student made those. Lens check it. No, Lens calling his girlfriend. He said, oh, I'll act like I'm using my cell phone app, but I'm really just calling my babe to see how she's doing. How you doing, babe? <laughs> it's me. Your blobular boyfriend. Yes. I've been um, Bill just called you a blob. <laughs> Should I let him talk to my girlfriend? No, I'm taking him out and beat him up. Show him you're not. Well, you have to show him you're not a blob. Say, you're not going to take this. He's 
he's got a tap out shirt on you, knucklehead. You don't say that to people with tap out shirts. They're already being so messy. Yeah. God, watch it, Bill. You don't even have to wonder if it's talking Yeah, Bill. So might as well have a sign on his forehead that says, go ahead and take me on. <laughs> Who's got it yet? Who's got V2 for me? Anybody? I mean V1. V1, that's the speed we're starting with. What? You, there is a unit conversion app. How much is it? Three? Maybe like $29. for a unit conversion app? What do apps cost anyway? A couple, uh, uh, 99 cents or something at the app store? Joey, I'm sorry, were you trying to talk to me about something? What was it? I guess it's on meters per second. We're okay, let's make it 30. Alan, 29 was close enough? For me. All right, we'll, we'll just call it 30. Because you're not paying attention to your speed anyway. That's why you're usually going too fast. You're much more intent on text messaging when you're driving. All right, so there we go. There's you in your car, presumably, going highway speeds. So you have some momentum. Just mass times velocity, we know what the momentum was. Uh, sooner or later, you need to come to a stop. Who doesn't? Gotta go get some coffee or charge your cell phone so you can get back out on the highway and do some more texting. So sooner or later, you gotta come to a stop. Uh, so that's the whole side one I called there. Figure out real quick for me what the change in momentum is then. To bring you from highway speeds to a stop, that's a, a change in momentum of what? Just calculate it real quick. In fact, you could just about do it in your head, I bet. But Alan, Alan did it in head, or acted like he did it in head. Then he's going to. Then he checked it anyway, and then Tyler said, what? 70 times 30 in your head? <laughs> All right, so, um, no, sorry, you're wrong. No, sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> What's the answer? What is the change in momentum? Yes. No. What's the change in momentum? You don't even need your calculator for this. Negative one hundred seconds. Meter. Angry. Phil's going. Thank God she wasn't yelling at me. That's what usually happened. Right. I forgot. The <laughs> Mike, what'd you say? I think you had it. Negative 2100. 2100. Newton seconds. Newton seconds. Uh, kilograms times meter per second. Is that a Newton second? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is because you know that's going to be a Newton second. They're equal, so that has got to be a Newton second. And you can check it, and it is. So if you're ever traveling at highway speed, and you ever come to a stop, it's going to take that, it's going to be a change in momentum of that amount. Let me just take that equation, move it up here so I can do the other side now. Bless you. Okay, we just did. Side one. No matter what, you're going highway speed. Sometime you got to come to a stop. That's the change in momentum. No matter what. So that's side one. All done. Even though it's the right hand side there, I'm calling that side one. Any questions about that side? Couldn't couldn't really be a whole lots more straightforward than that. 
side two, that's, that's, that's a different side. That's why it's side two. That, but there's, there's a whole lot of different physics going on there, even though they're equal. This side is already set. We've discussed it and we've put it to bed. You were going highway speeds. You came to a spot, stop. You're changing momentum minus 2100 newton seconds. No, no, no discussion. Non-negotiable. This side has got to be the same because they're equal. So this side has got to be, oops, forgot the delta T. This side has got to be minus 2100 Newton seconds. Nothing more to discuss about it. Oh, why negative? Yeah, because if you're moving one way, some force has got to work against you to bring you to a stop. That's the only way it's going to work. You need to, to decelerate, so you need a force to do that. And that's going to be a negative force if your velocity is positive. The force has got to be in the opposite direction of that. Also non-negotiable, so that's the negative, so no, no big deal there. We were talking about that kind of stuff uh, weeks and weeks ago. So this side set, we understand the negative, of course we understand the units. So let's look at these two things. There's two major ways this could happen. Let's say, uh, let's, we'll call them A and B. A. Ah, you come to a nice leisurely stop, you see your sign for your exit, you come on the exit ramp, you roll a little bit, you see the light up there is red, so you, you don't, you hardly even put on the brakes because the exit ramp is kind of going up the hill. Maybe that all takes you, uh, let's say, uh, 20 seconds. Is that, is that, that's fair? Drive along the highway, you know it's time to get off now. You're not going 65 anymore, it's time to prepare to get off. And all of that takes about 20 seconds, give or take a little bit. How much force is required to bring you to a stop? To change your momentum by this set amount, how much force is required to change your momentum in about 20 seconds? Negative, negative 105 newtons. Negative, again, meaning it's opposing your motion. So, uh, it takes about 105 newtons to bring you to a stop. That's not a lot of force, really. That Remember, a newton is give or take about an apple. That's about the force required to lift 100 apples. And you can bring yourself to a stop in a space of about 20. Now, if we threw the car in there too, we're going to need more force, of course, because we have more mass, we have more momentum that needs changing. But I'm just worried about you. That, you know, that way we can talk about whether you're in a big, gigantic tanker truck or on a motorcycle or running along the highway at that speed. Here's option A. I'm sorry, option B. Option A, take a while to do it, slow down nicely, still have a chance to get a few more text messages in there. Let's see, let's come to a stop uh, a, a little more abruptly. Let's say you are texting, not paying a whole lot of attention, you hit the bridge abutment. Come, same change in momentum, isn't it? But now it happens in, let's say, 0.02 seconds. That's about how long it's going to take you to come to a stop if you hit the bridge. Now what's the force? Huh? Still 
negative, yeah, we, we understand what that is. 105,000 newtons. Yeah, the, the time period went down by a thousand, factor of a thousand. The force is going to go up by a factor of a thousand. You're not going to survive that. That's why crashing kills you, because it happens so quickly that the force required to do the change in momentum has got to go way up to compensate for the fact that time went way down. You come to a stop very, very quickly, as in a crash, you're going to get killed. Except, you come to a crash, you, come, you hit the bridge in a relatively modern car, a car 15 years old or younger, what's going to happen? Airbag. Airbag is going to go off. Why does that save your life? All the airbag does, the only point of the airbag is to make delta T greater by enough that the force goes down by enough and you can survive. You might be damaged, but you might be alive, which is a lot better than dead for most people. That's the only point of the airbag, is to increase delta T to decrease F. That's the only point of the seat belts that we've had for, for 40 or 50 years. I remember when I was a kid, cars didn't have seat belts. My mom would tell us that she felt if she got in a head-on crash, she'd put out our arm, her arm and save our lives. And we were standing there on the vinyl bench seat of our Bel Air station wagon, because it's fun to stand there while you're driving along. I mean, if she'd even hit the brakes, we'd have been through the windshield. But she was going to save our lives and put her arm out. I don't think so. I think she was going to go like this. That's what I think. But we never got to that. But the seatbelt, only point was to extend this. Now the airbag extends this even more. Especially the early seatbelts, they were rigid. Now the ones nowadays, you know, you can move forward a little bit in them. The, they, they have a little bit of time to, to uh, take up the slack in them. Um, even have now built-in structure uh, in the car where they're attached where it'll, it'll kind of deform for a little bit before it brings you to stop. All of that just to increase delta T. Uh, motorcycle helmet, that's the only point to it. That's why there's foam inside of it to extend delta T when you splat your skull on the, on the pavement as all motorcycle riders end up doing sooner or later. It's only to increase the delta T to bring down F to some survivable limit. This side's all set by no matter what. This is the only side that you can do anything about. So you put on your seatbelt and you buy a car with, with airbags. And if the airbags ever pop, you go get them replaced. You don't just stuff them back in there and duct tape it over. Joey because you might need that airbag and you're not going to know when. Just to increase delta T. What? I know if they pop. Because the sunglasses you were wearing are now on the other side of your head and there's a sunglass shaped hole so right through. the airbag is released, you can't like the back? <laughs> no, I, I, I think most cars you can't even start, I believe. You can't drive them until you go get it replaced. But if you go to some cheap auto body place, they will sometimes try to sneak a used one in. And I don't think you want to do that's not a good place to cut corners. But it's pretty easy to tell if they pop. Because there they are. <laughs> you, you'll, you'll be saying, that wasn't there a second ago. <laughs> Don't know much about cars, huh? I do. I've never been the car. I don't know what an airbag does. Oh man! I don't watch videos you just said happens. that. You don't ever say I've never been in an accident. Well, I mean, I was last week on Wednesday. But. 
Oh, but other than, other than just last week. Oh, oh, and then there was the week. Oh, and and, and, and two months ago. Oh, oh, and, and four times last year. No, I just made the caveat here on the board and I believe What was the Delta T? I don't know. Did you survive it? Yeah. And Delta T was big enough. <laughs> and you're here to pester Phil. Okay, I have another question. When the airbag comes out, is it like blown up, or does it go down? No. It, it, well, uh, no, I just saw a, vid a slow motion video. You can go on YouTube and, and just put an airbag, and it'll somebody that one of the choices will be a very slow motion video, and they'll show it. And I think the time even runs with it, but it, it comes out and it's kind of a kind of a loose looking pillowy type thing. I guess, but that's because, you know, it's shaking around, it's happening very quickly, and it stays inflated for a little bit, but then it deflates, uh, all within uh, a second or two. If you see somebody in a crash, by the time you cross the street and get to them, that airbag will be down, and they'll be going, thank God I had an airbag, because look, and they'll pull out a sheet of calculations, and you can check them, and you can say, where's your negative sign? It's a threshold. Threshold, survival, uh, general. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Offhand, I don't know what it is. It's you know, it's something like uh, uh, a couple thousand newtons. Okay, but uh, it also does have. You can you can stand very high pressure or forces. I mean, if, it, if it's a very high force, but it's for such a small time. Which would, of course, mean a different product here. It's got to be some other different problem. Uh, you you can't do that. But uh, I don't know offhand what the survival is. It might even be in the textbook. I mean, yeah, maybe I should read that. Yeah. Well, you actually said it uh, with your cell phone. Well, that was for the, the climbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that one it is. That's, that's it. Well, I don't know. I, it, it might be different if they're taking a rope wrapped around your waist as opposed to a blunt force oh, to the head. Uh, I don't know. Some, well, um, who, you asked what was the limit? Yeah, you can give us a little report next week. Okay. And then just see if you can just Google it and see if you find something. And if you were to do this more realistically, we'd be integrating each separate force. Yeah, this yeah. by, by going through this integration, what we've said is what's the average force? In actuality, a collision force might look uh, might look something like this where uh, maybe this is the 0.02 seconds. Uh, in actuality, the, the collision force might look something like that. It would, it would come up, peak, and then drop off, and all of this very quickly. By us looking at the average force, we're saying, well, let's just, let's uh, essentially just have a value that gives us the same area under there. Because remember, this came from the integral of F dt, which is the area <coughs> under a force time graph. So by saying we're using the average area, we're saying, uh, uh, sorry, an average force, we're saying, oh, let's just uh, have something with the same area as the two. Because that's what that side number two is. Uh, it's actually the area under a force time graph. And in fact, if you remember, when we first started talking about kinetics, didn't I say there would be three methods to solve kinetics problems? Did I tell you that? I think I did. What was the first one we discussed? Remember? The simplest of all of them. It's F equals MA. If we know the acceleration, we can find out what forces will give us that. If we know the forces, we know what the acceleration will be. So it, it was really good. This was really good for 
general type kinetics problems or very good for constant force problems. Extremely well. For that, we did lots and lots of those problems. What was the second method we used for solving kinetics problems? It actually came from F equals MA. So they're not different. It was just a different way to look at the same thing that made it more usable for certain types of problems. The work energy equation came right from F equals MA, so they're not exclusive of each other. It just allowed us to look at problems a little bit differently. In fact, it became much more useful for certain types of problems where the force might not be constant. What type of problems? Position-dependent problems. Position -dependent problems. Uh, like springs. Where you are attached to a spring is very much a position type problem and if any force there is that changes with position it springs but they were pretty easy to handle all we had to do is figure out the potential energy before and after where the spring was all done with it so good for position dependent problems In fact, remember the, remember the work? Remember how work was defined? Who remembers? That was some time ago. Huh? Oh, some of the How was it? Mm -hmm. In fact, its full definition was the sum of the forces dotted with ds which means it was very useful if the forces change with position uh, when they change with position in a very predictable way like springs do we didn't have to deal with this integral very much but this integral is the area under a force position curve So if we had some force position curve and we had the force vary however it does, whatever the problem could possibly be, we could look at the area under that and we'd know what the work was. You wouldn't have to actually do the integral if you could just look at the graph and figure out the area. So we could very easily handle um, position dependent problems even if the force was position dependent. This is our third method, right here. This side, well, we know what that side is. That's the change in momentum. This side here, a force applied for a certain amount of time. Here we did force applied for a certain amount of distance. Now we're doing force applied for a certain amount of time. And it would make sense that that's uh, an important thing to look at, a useful thing to look at sometimes. Uh, we just saw it here. Could mean you live or die. But uh, how long a force is applied for or how long it is applied, that kind of makes sense that that works. You, you could have sat at home and, and even come up with that if you thought about it a little bit. This is called the impulse. The amount of impulse given to something is the area under the force time curve. And that's our third method. The impulse momentum equation. There it is right there for constant forces, constant mass. Good for problems that are time dependent especially if the force is time dependent. And there's our, our third and last method for solving our kinetics problems.
uh, doesn't mean that the other methods wouldn't work at all. For example, if we had some problem where I told you a force was applied for a certain amount of time, what's the change in velocity? You could go back here and say, oh, uh, sounds like a constant acceleration problem, I'll solve it this way, and you do just fine. Or you can solve it this way, it's, it's kind of already broken out for you as all the, the difference is. But if we did have a problem where the forces were time dependent, then all we need to do is take the area under the graph and we'd know what the impulse was. Once you know what the impulse is, you know what the change in uh, momentum is. So always cool to come to class and leave with something that might save your life. Any other classes that happened in today? They took from you, didn't they? They didn't give, they took. I give. You made aspirin in chemistry last semester. Huh? You made aspirin in chemistry last semester. Did they let you take it though? Did they let you actually have it? No. No, <laughs> yeah. see? No, it was supposed to be more pure than anything you could get in the store too. It saved you from a heart attack. Yours backfired. Yeah, there's a little. Uh, it gave you a headache. I didn't take it. This is shame. Made it. You made it. Mm -hmm. Is that why you wouldn't take it? Mm -hmm. It backfired. What was it? Black. It turned purple on the test. I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> so there goes your career with yeah. the bear or Excedrin or mm -hmm. man, bummer. Not good. All right. Um, all right. Let's. Let's uh, let's continue on with this then. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got a whole new method. Uh, the one, not that the others don't save your life. Uh, we could have said with the first one, we need to keep the acceleration low enough so the forces are low enough, uh, and we would have come to the very same conclusion. But uh, when you when you look at the impulse momentum method. It, uh, I think it just becomes so much more obvious why seat belts and, and airbags and the like are, are so very useful. All right, so let's, uh, let's do a little bit more. Let's do a little bit more then with collisions because we can either do them as systems where we don't have to worry about the forces or if we need to we can look at them individually because uh, you colliding with something that doesn't move that has no change in momentum is going to give us a, a very useful problem anyway. So far we've only looked at one dimensional collisions and so far we've actually only looked at one kind of, of uh, one-dimensional collision. Uh, it's called a perfectly inelastic collision that we looked at. I didn't give you that name, but there it is. It's the type of collision where the two objects stick together and their subsequent velocity is the same because they're now really, in essence, a single object. They've gone from being two independent objects to a, to a single uh, object. Um, after the collision, the object will have some velocity V prime. And in fact, that might be our unknown in the problem. We have. The, the two objects moving to each other towards each other in some way. They collide, they stick together perfectly, and we want to figure out what the velocity is afterwards. Or, as might happen in a crash, we know one of the velocities before. Maybe that's a car that had one of those black boxes in it. The other one didn't, but we know what the 
after collision velocity was, so the unknown becomes the second car's velocity before collision. We want to know if he gets the ticket. Either way, these problems are such that there's a single unknown. Therefore, we need how many equations to solve that problem? We need one equation to solve a one unknown problem. What was that one equation to solve these problems? Momentum, conservation of momentum. The momentum was conserved because as they collided and we look at them in the system, the forces are internal, we didn't have to worry about them. That's exactly what we did. One, one unknown, one equation required, no sweat, we've got it. There it is right there. Remember uh, on Monday, I think it was. We also did the kinetic energy uh, calculation with the, with some of those problems. We'd already solved the problem, and then I said after we'd solved it, by that I mean we found the velocity we didn't know. I said uh, calculate the change in kinetic energy. What was the change in kinetic energy? Now I know how to calculate it, and I hope you do too, but what was it? Look, if I asked you what was the change in momentum, you'd say, oh, yeah, it's zero. Now I ask you what was the change in kinetic energy. We did that calculation. We did it twice, I think. Two different uh, collisions we did it. What was the change in kinetic energy? Was it the same for the two different collisions we did? We did one where the uh, rearward object hit the one in front and they were both going the same direction anyway, like a rear end on the highway. We also redid it with the very same speeds, only they were going towards each other. Did we get the same change of kinetic energy for those two? No, we didn't. In fact, it was quite a bit different. Did we, did, what could we say about the change of kinetic energy though? Can we give some general general statement to this, something easy I could write down here about change in kinetic energy of perfectly elastic collisions. Huh? No, no, just tell me, uh, look at the two delta k's we calculated. Both of them were positive, negative, zero, what? Delta K, what, I, what do I write next? Delta K. Was it negative? Both times? It went up once? The, that's what I'm asking. Delta K. Both times. Was I the one here? Delta K was less than zero both times. It was, we lost kinetic energy both times. Uh, here, we're going to do one more. One more of those calculations real quick. No calculators on this. Mass M, moving with velocity V. Mass M, same mass, moving with velocity V. They hit and stick. What's the final velocity of that two? Huh? Zero meters per second. No, you don't need units when it's zero. Because it's zero for feet per second, or yeah. furlongs, what was it? Furlongs per fortnight. Our favorite. Mm -hmm. Subsequent velocity zero. Any disagreement? Any dispute? Any wondering how Alan came up with it that quick? Was he just guessing and hoping it was right? Because he's kind of sneaky. Maybe he was doing that. 
You, everybody came up to zero as well? To the nearest tenth of a decimal place? What was the change in kinetic energy? Was the change in kinetic energy zero? Less than zero. In fact, uh, an absolute maximum less than zero. We lost all the kinetic energy in that collision, right? Started with uh, actually two times one half mv squared ended up with zero. We lost the maximum possible amount we could have lost. Uh, however you want to say it. We could say, I guess, um, uh, I don't know what, delta K2 equals zero is a possibility. I don't know. I don't want to put that there because it's not always true. But it certainly is true that we could lose all the kinetic energy. So I don't know how to write that down there. We just have to keep that in mind as a possibility. All right, so that's the one collision we've looked at in some detail there. So let's look at uh, another one. Um, here's some mass. Oh, look. Samantha got a new car after she crashed her got one last week. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's some mass. We'll just make up some numbers here. It's a very lightweight car. It's only three kilograms. It's moving with some velocity. Let's say four meters per second. Here's some other mass. We'll say. Four kilograms. And moving with some velocity, V2, we'll say two meters per second. They hit and bounce off each other. They don't stick like they used to. They bounce off each other this time, like billiard balls do. Or like your fist in that guy's nose. We got in front of you at Cumberland's the other day. Remember him? Yeah, you remember that guy? Yeah. So they hit, they bounce off, this is, uh, this is M1 now going some velocity V1 prime. This one bounces off going with some velocity V2 prime. In fact, uh, one of them could even keep going in the same direction. Doesn't lose all of its forward speed, just loses some of it. We, we don't know. But let's say that's, the, that's what we observe. Now, how many unknowns? Two unknowns. We don't know either one of those. Before we could calculate the final velocity, we only had one unknown because they stuck together conveniently. Now we have two unknowns. Obviously, we need two equations. Can anybody suggest one equation? Nope. You can do even better than that. Here, here's a hint. Here's a hint. Maybe this will help you. That helps? 
Yes. I can hear all the light bulbs going off. That didn't help? That should have helped. Because we already looked at an equation. We did that and it helped. We could solve the problem then when we did this. I just did it again. So what's one of the equations we could use? Huh? No, you can do better than that. Because he already said that. So you can certainly do better than copying something that's already been been uh, disallowed. Conservation. Conservation. It's a collision within a system. No external forces. Wouldn't momentum be conserved? You bet. So there's one equation. That's not two equations. That's one equation. In two dimensions, it'll be two, equa two equations. But in one dimension, it's only one equation. So we're halfway there. Second equation. Quick, get on your phone, go to eBay, go to equations, go to extra equations, make a bid, quick. Get us an extra equation. Well, like I said, they bounce off each other, so they're elastic. So it could be used to force of the spring. If the spring force is constant. Well, uh, there's, it's certainly not an inelastic equation. And you called it a what? Uh, and this is an elastic collision. When they bounce off, this is an elastic collision. You might even think that if we had perfectly inelastic collisions, we might have perfectly elastic collisions. Perfectly, practically perfect in every way. Nobody got that reference? That, that literary reference there? What was it? Practically perfect in every way. You have kids, don't you? What father are you? <laughs> What's that? Disney World? Yeah. Trash. Mary Poppins was practically perfect in every way, wasn't she? Yeah. Wasn't Maria von Trapp? Oh, you don't get that one either. God, it's like talking to a cultural vacuum with students nowadays. But if I was talking about some Z diggy diggy low rapper guy, you're dull. Oh, yeah, I know about him. I, I liked him on Facebook. <laughs> But Mary Poppins, over on your head in a flying umbrella. <laughs> we, I, we, should, we, should, we should have just Google, We're ready to go here, so we can Google something, and then you get, oh, now I get it. It's right there. It's on Google. The, the only repository for any cultural information I've got anymore. We do have such a thing as perfectly elastic collisions. When we do, and there are imperfectly elastic collisions. In fact, almost every collision in real life is perfect, imperfectly elastic. Most things do hit and bounce off each other, even cars. Rarely do cars hit and stick together like that. They usually hit and kind of skid off in their own directions with a bunch of flying metal and glass and stuff. Those are imperfectly elastic collisions. But there are perfectly elastic collisions and, and billiard balls are very, very close to that. Uh, atomic collisions are very, very close to perfectly elastic. And when we have a perfectly elastic collision, we get our second equation. And it's as simple to write as this one is. Anybody want to take a guess what it is? Thank you. 
Huh? Have something to do with it does? It is. Conservation of kinetic energy. So we could do we could do a collision like this, measure the velocities after the collision, check how much kinetic energy there was before and after, we know how perfect or imperfect that collision was. We don't have imperfectly elastic, imperfectly inelastic, but we do have imperfectly elastic. imperfectly elastic collisions. They also have two unknowns. Actually, there's three. Yeah, there are three unknowns, actually, in a, in a, in a perfect, imperfectly elastic collision. Three unknowns. Uh, two of the unknowns are the subsequent velocities, but momentum is still conserved because there's no external forces when we take the two as a system, no matter what kind of collision it is. The third unknown is, what's delta K? All we know is we lose kinetic energy in an imperfect elastic collision. So we need a third equation. The third equation in imperfectly elastic collisions is called the coefficient of restitution. And I'm not going to define it here because we're not going to use it. Um, it has to do with how well certain things bounce off each other. You know if you take a tennis ball and drop it, it only comes up to a certain height. That's because of its coefficient of restitution. That, yeah, that's a little scripty. Uh, if you take dynamics next year, uh, which I teach in the spring, we'll we'll actually come up with that and do some problems with it. It's a number. The only it's experimentally determined, just like uh, coefficient of friction was. The only way to find it out is to do a test. You take some things and you bounce them off each other and see how far they rebound. Then you can know the coefficient of restitution. It's it's. Not quite, but it's kind of like how much kinetic energy do we lose? Because if you've got a, a tennis ball and you drop it and it only returns to 80% of its height, that kind of makes sense there, then that, that, that all goes together. Um, if, we, if we take a tennis ball and don't drop it on the, this floor, but we drop it on a carpet, it bounces entirely different. So it has to do, just like friction did, with the two things interacting. <coughs> Coefficient restitution also has to do with whatever two things it is that are hitting each other. Is it a uh, two ivory pool balls hitting, or is one uh, would your arm fall off? Yeah. Is, is one a billiard ball and one a potato or something? That's a different collision. So we have we have those three possible collisions that uh, that we look at in our class. All right, let's uh, let's add to it a little bit. Oh no, I know what I know what a little dual problem here. Kind of a a reverse collision, but it still has all the same characteristics of the very same collisions we've been looking at. So. Uh, let's see what you can make of this. Imagine a, a rocket launch, a, a ballistic rocket launch. You know what that means when I say ballistic? No, evidently not. What's it mean when you go ballistic? What's it, sorry, Phil, something you can... But what's it mean when Samantha goes ballistic? Nothing. It just means the sun's up, doesn't it? 
<laughs> I got your name right at least. Uh, what's ballistic mean in terms of projectile motion? Does that have to do with curvature? Uh, if if yes, if a if a projectile is a ballistic projectile, it's going to have a very much different trajectory than does a non-ballistic one, but. What do you see in the object that tells you whether it's ballistic or not? A ballistic trajectory is one that is not powered. Uh, most rockets are powered through a great portion, if not all of their flight, because their, their engines are burning. But if you take something like a, like a bullet, where there's this huge explosion in the rifle barrel to shoot it out, but then after that, it's not powered anymore and it just coasts, and it's actually a free fall problem. So let's take this to be a ballistic rocker, rocket launch. So there's a huge explosion to get it going, and then it's going for a while. Very same type of thing uh, uh, fireworks are. They're ballistic, big explosion in the mortar thing, and then after that, they're unpowered. There's there's a lot of pretty sparks falling off and stuff, but that's just so you're impressed. All right, so here's here's a trajectory of some kind. Let's see, I think I have some details we can put to it. Wow, look how fast we're going here. Wow. Where'd that problem go? I guess I don't have that problem. Must have been uh, my... My, my favorite physics class I gave that to. Oh well, we'll make up some stuff. Nope, there it is. It's filed under fat brother-in-law. There it is. All right, so we have, we have a nice trajectory launch here. Um, so here's some of the details. Uh, turns out, at the very peak of the launch of, of this ballistic trajectory, right when it has a velocity up there, oh, we don't have that, but we do have the height at a height of 2.5 times 10 to the fourth meters. Right at the very peak there, uh, maybe it is a, 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 a simple firework or maybe it was something tragic that happened, but there was an explosion on board that blew it into two perfect halves. Conveniently, that's, you know, all physics problems are nice and neat and perfect like this. Blew it into two perfect halves. Right here when it had that velocity, Right? No vertical velocity at that point. Right there, it blew into two perfect pieces. One half the mass in each piece. Happened in such a way that one piece fell straight down below the explosion where the peak was. The other piece, with the fat brother-in-law on board, landed where? In the ocean. You're right, you may go. That's what I want you to figure out. Let me, uh, let me make sure you don't need something else if I have it here. Yeah, we're... Yep. The launch velocity... was such that... the vertical component of the launch velocity was 5 times 10 to the third. meters per second.
break that stuff. Nope. Uh, horizontal, you said? Huh? Is that so horizontal? Yeah, X. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. All right. Don't start calculating because you got nothing to calculate. You can do a little bit with trajectory, but then what are you going to do about the, the, the explosion part? So let's think about that a little bit. Uh, we've got this, this thing that explodes. Um, it causes, it ca well, it, it clearly causes an acceleration on the two halves because here the halves were together but still whatever half was that went this way had a very clear sharp change in in uh, velocity it was going horizontally and then suddenly it's going straight down there had to be a huge force on that a significant well that was the explosion that's what shot it straight down from from it going sideways how big was the force on that piece that did that? In fact, since we're talking about collisions, we don't want just the force, we also want however long that force acted. So, how big was the force and how long did it act during the explosion to make the first half do that? Second. You don't have to answer because you already know where the second part is. It's in the ocean. This should be straight up. I didn't ask about the second half. I asked about the first half. We only are talking about this one half so far. That. Just look at this one half. In fact, it would help. We'll, we'll draw the rocket as two halves. There's a pink half and a blue half, a boy half and a girl half. And it went up to here, exploded, and the pink half went down there. Went straight down. What was the force on the pink half that made it do that? We know what, we know what its velocity is there, and then suddenly it's got this velocity down there, it lands there. The force? Yeah, the no, force can't be V. It's M, the mass, times the change of velocity divided by the change. Now I asked what's the force and what's the time. I didn't ask what the mass and the velocity are. I asked you what the force and the time are. Remember, for the for the collision, uh, our our collision equation really is the impulse momentum equation. The impulse side has force and time on it. That's our collision equation. What is the force and the time on this? It's the mass times the change of velocity. Okay, that's. This side. Right. That's got to be equal. Well, we can do a little bit more with it than that. What is it that we did in collisions to solve collisions before we had this full impulse momentum equation? What did we do with the collision that made the whole thing such that we didn't even care what the force and the time were? Make it all one system. Well, that's easy here. It starts out as one system. Our magic system boundary there. After collision, and it breaks into two halves, can we still treat it as one system? Yes. Sure. Why not? We, we, when we first did collisions, we had them apart and treated as a collision, I mean as a system. And then they stuck together. This is just the reverse. They're already stuck together. Then they come apart. But we treated them as a system before when they're apart. Let's treat them as a system now when they're apart. 
So I don't know where this other piece goes. I don't know where the blue piece is. We'll just draw it somewhere for the sake of argument. But it's still a system. So if we look at this system, whether they're actually touching or not, we look at the system of these two halves. Now what's the force and the time uh, during which that force acts? We're talking about, here's our system. Right. Our system undergoes an explosion and our system now is there. It's bigger, but it's still just those two pieces. Nothing went in or out of that system boundary. The force of the explosion is uniform in any direction. Yeah, something on board blew up. No one, my fat brother-in-law, he probably burped and that was sufficient. <laughs> I just figured out why I don't get Christmas cards anymore from this. <laughs> I got it. He's watching the videos. <laughs> yes, he is. I had to stop all the mother-in-law jokes because I knew she was going to watch them. So, what was the force and the amount of time during which it acts for this? This is really, uh, this is in a, a essence, the first collision we looked at run backwards, didn't it? We had two things apart, they hit and stuck, Here's two things stuck, they come apart. So what's the force and the delta T that force acts? We don't need to know. We didn't know need, need to know first. Why would we need to know now? Is the force that shoots that thing down internal to the system. Because if it is, what's the impulse part? Zero. What external force was? Well, there's, there's the gravity that pulls it down, but during the explosion, remember when we're talking about these collisions, we're talking about the instant before and the instant after. During the instant of the explosion, Gravity doesn't have any time to act. It's so quick. So we're not going to worry about that. Maybe it drops a little tiny bit. We're not going to worry about it. That explosion is an internal force. Didn't come from outside. came from inside, whatever it was. So the force of the explosion, we can call it a, yeah, we'll do it as a vector. The force of the explosion on the system, well, was internal. We only do external forces when we calculate those things, don't we? So, momentum must be conserved. Fair enough? All right, one last thing to take for the weekend. We'll pick it up back on Monday. It's not going to be easy to calculate this. Uh, uh, if this if the explosion was such that it lost all its velocity and just dropped from there, let's say it didn't have any vertical velocity either after the explosion, it just came to a stop, and then fell. It's gonna, gonna. Well, maybe we could figure out. But but here's the bigger thing we can use, and it's going to be very useful in two-dimensional uh, collisions. Momentum is conserved. We don't even necessarily have to calculate the momentum of the individual pieces. Remember uh, the way we did it before, we did the momentum of the system before equals the, oh I know what I, I used the uh, little tick mark, equals the momentum of the system after. 
another way to write this would be the momentum of the center of mass. Remember we were looking at that? Was that Monday or was that a week ago? We were looking at center of mass. How to find out the center of mass of a system. The center of mass, the momentum of the center of mass does not change. Does the mass of the system change? If the mass of the center of the system doesn't change, then the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change either. So if we can figure out where the center of mass is and what it's doing, we can find where the other piece goes. And it turns out it's not in the ocean. It was a darn good guess, though. That's where I would have looked first. So that's what we'll do on Monday. We'll look at the center of mass and figure out what happens with this problem. Boy, if that's not a incentive enough to come back, what is? In fact, you might not even want to leave. Well, I guess you do. It's like you do. Fine, go ahead and leave. <laughs>